Welcome to the Creative Community. I'm your host, David Starkey, and my guest this time is artist Nathan Huff. Nathan, welcome. Thank you. Um, I'm really excited to have you here. Uh, you've got some fantastic work that viewers are going to take a look at, and we're going to take a look at. Um, but I'd love to hear a little bit of how you got started as an artist. You teach at Westmont now. Correct. Um, what's your path into sitting in that chair? Oh, it's been long and circuitous <laughs> um, and full of rich things. Yeah. I have drawn my entire life. Okay. Uh, my folks you were one have, of those little kids who... Yes, yeah. my folks have boxes of drawings that I made, uh, and they usually have uh, wild adventure stories of ducks and sea lions. <laughs> and there are warrior ducks and princess ducks, and they're fighting. And right. So it's fun to look back through those. Yeah. Uh, and that has just led me on a trajectory of trying to make narratives uh, that feel like they reflect my life and yeah. reflect the things around me. Yeah. So it's been a, a long passion. Well, I, when you're saying that, I, I, with some of the stuff we're going to see, I, I can imagine warrior ducks and princess ducks good, good. still <laughs> making an appearance in your work. Um, these have a, a real sense of the, the fantastical, I think. Mm. Um, uh, there's, there's an implied narrative in a lot of the work that you're doing. Yeah. Um, let's, though, let's, let's jump in and, and take a look. Um, the first image, I believe, is something that you sort of see as kind of a, a, a seed for things that, that happen mm -hmm. later on. So yeah. um, let's take a look at the first one and um, tell us what, what we're looking at. So this work is um, probably from maybe 2008 or so, and I have spent a, a lot of my life painting in oils and uh -huh. really enjoying that. And right. this is a, a piece that I made early graduate school at Cal State Long Beach. Okay. Uh, and it holds um, significance because it kind of begins to merge a lot of the different things that I'm interested in, in art, of the passage of time, of trying to capture the multiplicity Mm -hmm. um, of different experiences, of simultaneity of moments, uh, and also the collision of the highly domestic and the kind of uh, anesthetized parts of our life, like the inner hallway of a school building, with slightly more surrealistic and magical moments, like uh, pigeons flying through the space. Mm -hmm. uh, and so for me, it, I think it's, it laid the founda foundation for a lot of the work that I've made since then. Uh, and it has offered me a glimpse to say, what happens if we suspend time, if we build a mini schism through it? If you'll notice on this mm -hmm. image, it's, it's split slightly and there are different reflections happening at different times. Uh, and then the potential for um, the otherworldly to enter. Um, around that time, I began to make the paintings so dense, they were getting so complex, mm -hmm. that I decided to pull them apart. Okay. So the next image um, maybe offers a a stepping stone um, from there, where I began to take similar types of interior spaces uh, and narrative experiences and pull them out and Literally put them on different apart, pieces. Yeah, right. yeah. You know, I, as you were speaking about the simultaneity, uh, I, I was weirdly reading Ruskin on Giotto last <laughs> night. I mean, I don't do that every night, but, <laughs> but um, he was talking about the, the way in Renaissance art that frequently you will see um, multiple narrative moments in the same frame, right? So, so you see Christ as, a, as an infant and Christ as a child. And, and is there any sense of, of a religious element to that, of trying to, you, and you mentioned it with looking out into another world. Is that, is yeah. that somewhere buried in there? You know, I, I too have been fascinated by uh, what I understand as the Predella narrative at uh -huh. the base of kind of Renaissance altarpieces, where it does give different glimpses of a story and then one larger one. Right. Um, I don't think I'm explicitly looking at spiritual narratives, but I do think that there's a sense of wonder, a sense of kind of lofty connection. Mm -hmm. um, at times, the work is drawn from religious imagery. There's an image we'll look at later uh, that's pulled from St. Bernini or St. Teresa mm -hmm. uh, in Ecstasy, mm -hmm. a sculpture by Bernini in Rome. In Rome yeah. um, so there are, there are connections to that, but they're not often directly representative of a spiritual experience. Okay. Well, let's take another uh, look at, at your sure. work here. Um, 
What are we looking at? This is very. <laughs> this is in Sullivan's, right? This is in uh, in Sullivan's. Where did I see this recently? This, other than this um, picture. This was up in Ventura at the New Media Gallery yeah, at the uh, Ventura College. That's where I saw it. Um, and there's also a video of it later. But uh, there is a sense in my art of, I like to imagine that I take an object or an idea and throw it up in the air. Right. And then if I could freeze it there and walk around it uh -huh. and contemplate, what are the emotional resonances? What are the histories and the stories? Uh, and sometimes I get frustrated and I make things. This piece is called This, Blo this Drawing this blows. Blows. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which I was just making all these things that I thought were terrible. All right. um, well, if, so. if, if viewers have a really tiny TV set, um, it's basically a, a fan. It's on, and right. it looks as though it's blown all of these things away from the center of, of the yeah. thing. So, yeah, I mean, there's a real sense of, of fun and joy, too. I mean, you mm. know, maybe things are thrown up, but... but it, it looks cool. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I, I want that. I want a level of kind of humor and maybe pathos at the same time. Yeah, of, right. You know, a ream of typing paper just got <laughs> exploded. <laughs> well, let's take a look at the, at the next image that yeah. we have. Um, and this is Pantone? Is it, mm -hmm. it? This is titled Pantone Disruption. Disruption. Um, and you'll notice there's a series of water glasses with various stages of kind of disruption happening in them. Uh, behind them is a drawing of a sperm whale, uh, and then behind that is a series of kind of blue bands, uh, and it's based off of the Pantone color of the year. I think this was in 2000. It's like okay. a kind of a teal color. <laughs> okay. Uh, and basically, I, I'm often interested in these mundane, decorative, and... Right, because Pantone, when I think of for industrial use or decorative use, yeah, yeah. not high art. Yeah. Indeed, and, and also the simplicity of a water glass, so this kind of right. sandwich between this is this... Uh, a highly archetypal kind of charged image of a sperm whale, right. both from literature and Moby Dick and right, other. Right. Just it's a magnificent creature. Well, what's what makes you an artist versus me is I might think of something like this, but I wouldn't be able to do it. I mean, you mm. know, the 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 bridge from conception to execution. Mm. It's a long one. <laughs> well, I would say the same for poetry. So. <laughs> well, I mean, I guess I, that's just part of your part of your art form. I mean, yeah. what, as you're making something like that, um, are you making a lot of sketches, a lot of preliminary things that are mostly taking place in your head? Um, they are often taking place in, yes, many, many sketches of different things. And as I build sketches, they become this kind of snowball that keeps rolling. Okay. Okay. And sometimes it grabs things uh -huh. from other parts of the work. Right. Uh, so the next image is maybe a good example of that. Um, I've been working with wood floors um, for some time. Oh no, this is, this is a great way too. So yeah, perfect example another whale of on the top. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, this piece is entitled, This Is How It Is. Uh, and it's a loosely a self-portrait of trying to balance uh, the many different dynamics at play. Uh, and this is a curious piece because each uh, I'll call them character, although they're not specific characters, but each element in this has been representative of different parts of my work. Okay. So the bear has shown up in a lot of different works. Mm -hmm. The rocking chair at the base was one that my great-grandmother had. The boat, I know, this isn't... Boats are symbolic yeah. for the kind of individual journey, the deer. Um, so it's a kind of a accretion of all of these different... Yeah, and if we look down at the, at the bottom there, the, that... Um, Rocking chair looks pretty <laughs> unsteady. It's like it's it just one way or the other, and the whole thing's going to fall. Indeed, so, yes. Yeah, okay. yeah. There's a sense of balance and um, juggling that I often look for in my work and probably as part of my life as well. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Let's take a look at, at the next image. And th this may be going back to what you were talking about previously. No, it's the, the owl. So. Yeah, so these, I guess, I would, I would correlate similar to the whale piece uh, in that all growing up I would always see faces in patterns mm -hmm. you know upholstery patterns right. and wallpaper patterns and this damask pattern has been fascinating to me for some time uh, and if you look closely there are potentially faces of owls that are emerging out of it and uh, you've brought them out and I have yeah. yeah so I did a series of paintings and you can scroll through these um, where the owl is moving um, from behind the wallpaper pattern uh, and I did these on large scrolls they're mm -hmm. 40 foot um, scrolls, yeah. uh, and then this installation was hung um, in Riverside in the Culver uh, Museum. And so here's the full installation of it. The ones previously show some details. But I am just really fascinated in how do we take something that's simple and everyday and infuse it, inject it with mm -hmm. um, something potentially more. 
When you were there watching people interact with it, what, what, what was their response? It was lovely to see people excited. Uh -huh. They would often walk in and just... Yeah. Uh, I mean, well, part of what's, what I think is interesting about that piece in particular is that they're hand-painted. Uh -huh. So it has the sense of wallpaper, but the more time you spend with yeah. it, the more complicated it gets. How long does it take you to make something like that? Um, I worked on that for three or four months, probably, uh, it's pretty in preparation fast. for the show. Yeah. Do you think of yourself as someone who works pretty quickly? I, my wife often tells me I'm a manic maker. <laughs> <laughs> so I do work very fast. Yeah. Yeah. So you have two little kids too, right? Yeah, yeah. you got to work fast. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> there are many pockets of time now. And do you have a studio that you're working with, or is it a home? Or in, in I have a home studio, and then at Westmont College during the summer, I have access to some really wonderful space right, there. Right, right. Tell me a little bit more about, about your process. I, I'm always curious about that. I mean, it, well, you've talked about drawing is, is kind of crucial to your process, essential mm -hmm. from when you began as an artist. Um, we'll, we'll just keep up with, it, with the owls yeah. that we just saw. What, how does that evolve? Um, it's, oh, you get a commission, I assume, in this case, right? Or um, in this case, I had the opportunity to do the exhibition at right. this gallery, right. and so I proposed and said, I'd love to do these in the center of the space, okay. and I'd love to do these other elements. You knew you had this big space to work yeah. with. Yeah. Uh, and in particular in that space, there are, there's a really wonderful architecture as well that mm -hmm. I was trying to play off of. Mm -hmm. But I, um, I'm often, when I'm invited to do an exhibition in a place, or I know I'm going to, I try and think about what stories are already present mm -hmm. in that space, mm -hmm. uh, and then what um, narratives I might bring to the work as well. And what stories were, were present in that space? Um, this kind of column at the top of the columns had these wonderful beige um, curvilinear forms mm -hmm. um, that I just thought were really wonderful and they felt like they echoed some uh, of the okay. more elaborate um, damask wallpaper patterns that I'd seen. Mm -hmm. um, it was also an interesting space to transition through. Uh, you'll notice that you can walk kind of around and through them. Let's take a look at the next image and uh, I think we're moving on to a, a different work. Yeah, this is called torque, right? This is. <laughs> so, so this, this yeah. might be a good one to talk a little bit about process. Okay. Um, I often hear stories or pull specific experiences from life um, or from poets or people that articulate things more beautifully than I can, and then I'm stuck with those images. Uh, and this image is called torque. It's a series of um, deer that are suspended They're in space. They're flying everywhere. They yeah. are. <laughs> Uh, and I don't often disclose the stories behind them in the exhibitions, sure, but I'll tell yeah. you, um, okay. this is based um, off of an experience growing up in Colorado and my mom hitting a deer in a snowstorm oh, okay. uh, and kind of watching with horror this sure. huge animal twist through oh, the air. Oh my gosh. Uh, and so to make this, I actually looked on YouTube for videos of animals being hit by cars. Oh my gosh. And for, paused them to try and find wow. the right type of torque. Yeah. Uh, it also, um, I'm interested in making something that maybe pulls from a horrific moment, but also looking at the potentially other ways that it can be interpreted. So they look like they could potentially be jumping on trampolines or... Right, that's I was <laughs> gonna say, you know, we we're, we're have this light tone in our voice, but <laughs> some animal rights activists may be watching and saying, wait a second, you know. Indeed, so there's that, that level that I want, I want to connect to the undercurrent of uh, the, the trauma of some stories. Famous, yeah. yeah, and then also look at um, how, distancing oneself from that. Okay. Sometimes that's a, you know, a way of removing oneself from an experience, mm -hmm. uh, is to try and build that in. But based off of that, the deer, the images following this um, play into some of the different ways of building narratives. Okay. So, so the next one is uh, photographs of me in my studio um, pretending that these deer weren't hit by a car, but rather were leaping on mm. trampolines. And so I am jumping around. You can go to the next image, enjoying the kind of free-flowing absurdity of it. And, and did you get responses from people saying this is an awful moment or how happy these deer are? <laughs> Both. <laughs> Both. Both, yeah. yeah. Right, right. And I, I like that. Uh, I also like as we start to inhabit stories and works, they, t they take on other elements too. Mm -hmm. um, so the next image is I got into a car accident in my Honda Civic in Los Angeles um, and and then sculpted a deer because I was so deeply in right. this thing of deer you know, that I had, you know, this deer I'd hit by accident and right. caused this accident. Uh, and then I moved on to trying to heal the deer. So I started sewing deer out of cloth. Oh, wow. Um, I grew grass on coffee tables in my studio and 
had them. Is that what we're looking at the, here? That's what we're looking at yeah. them here. Had them kind of leaping off of these different layers of grassy knolls, and um, again, again, trying to trying to explore the the trauma, but also the beauty. Right, um, right. And from there, um, this is the work uh, that I referenced earlier. Um, this is called Fluorescent Divine mm -hmm. uh, to Bernini's Saint Teresa in Ecstasy in Rome. Uh, where St. Teresa is kind of writhing around in passion uh, and looking at a light source above her. She uh, is, yeah. And so <laughs> you know, I, I, I know that work well and love it, and I, I see it now, but when I was looking at your work before the yeah. show started, that never would have occurred to me. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Well, I, I guess I was trying to transport it into, like, can one have a transformative, you know, ecstatic spiritual experience in an office building? Yeah. Like, could a fluorescent light... Right, you know, well, we got generate, <laughs> right? <laughs> generate that kind of moment. Yeah. So. so, I mean, is that part of what you're trying to do with your artist is to, to move viewers towards the transcendent? I think I'm often trying to move myself towards oh, that. Oh, okay. And if we come along with you, that's great. Or, yeah, or... that's a hope, but I don't know that. Uh -huh. I don't see it as necessarily a vehicle towards that. But that's, that's the space that I am always kind of trying to yeah, negotiate. Yeah, yeah. Well, and that makes, as a, as a poet, that makes me think of, you know, to what extent is one writing for oneself? And, and you always want a reader. And so it, trying to find that happy medium somewhere between what feels right and personal and intensely, you know, just there for you and yeah. also connects with someone else. It can be hard. It's very hard, yes. Yeah. Yeah. How do you know when you've achieved that, or do you? The moments where I feel most pleased with that is when someone comes to the work and, and comes and says, this reminds me of, ah, okay. you know, or I had this experience where, right. uh, and if, if someone has connected with the, an emotional cord in the work, right. that's usually what I most look for. Okay. I, don't, I don't often want people to look at it and say, well, this means this means this. Right, right. It, it feels There's a no little one bit to too one direct. Yeah. Okay. So. Let's go back and keep looking at, at your work, Nathan. I, I, it's it's fun to to, to, to look at what you're coming Thank up with, you. and this is another piece. <laughs> yes. So I have this one in here as well because there's deer in this as well. Behind this bed, you can see there's this kind of monster of pillows that are turning into deer, stuffed deer. Um, I did this exhibition. Uh, the next image as well shows a, a larger example of it um, right after the recent elections, and it was called sadness, sleep, and sanctity. <laughs> this is kind of, how does one negotiate with insomnia and reading news all night? Right, right. Just watching the kind of polarization and, and discombobulation of our, of our country. So we've got the bed, we've got the, 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 the dream or whatever uh -huh. coming up, rising up from the floor. Talk about the, the, the things that are up there in the air. Yes, yeah, so there's a, a series of um, woven uh, airplanes, okay. uh, and they're made out of basketry different things, and they're all kind of unraveling out of a lampshade uh, that's on the bedside table that's okay. connected to the bed. Uh, it's, uh, and how does one make a, a, an airplane out of a basket? <laughs> YouTube. <laughs> YouTube. I looked up again YouTube. I looked up how to, how to do basketry, and then as that kind of progressed, I started pulling forms out of it. All right. And I, again, I just think about flights of fancy of when you sit in your bed or sit reading a book, you know, your mind can wander mm -hmm. and unravel in different sorts of ways. Yeah. And so if is this basket woven lampshade turned into something else and moved right. through the space, what might it look yeah. like? Yeah, um, that's fantastic. So, yeah, well, I think we have, we may have one, at least one more uh, of those images. We'll see what's, what's next on our... Oh, we're back to the to the bear now. You mentioned that earlier when you were talking about your self-portrait. Um, yeah. Why is the bear such a crucial uh, figure for you? Uh, that's a great question. It feels largely archetypal to mm -hmm. me in that it has this kind of uh, narrative potential of a darker underbelly of a hibernating space of something that goes in in winter and comes out in summer. Mm -hmm. I grew up in the mountains of Colorado and encountered a lot of them. Right. Uh, and in this case, um, the bear is kind of levitating over the a The shadow of an airplane, right? Yes. Yeah. And you'll notice, you know, from the last image, the airplanes and the baskets then kind of weave into shadows being cast in interior spaces. Uh, and I did a, an exhibition where I was really interested in trying to track down um, the lost Malaysian 747 flight oh, from wow. several years ago. Yeah. I was thinking, like, 
we do the strange thing where we hurdle our bodies through the air in metal tubes, uh, and then tragically this was lost. Um, and so there's a, there's a lot of work about, about that loss, about that, the shadows that are left behind, about trying to uncover mm, that. Okay. So it's a kind of a collision between our, our stories. We've got just about eight minutes left, and I want to make sure that we get to all our images. So sure. let's take a look at, at the next one. This is a, a video showing the, the piece in context, right? Correct. You'll notice there's wood floors kind of coming off of the ground. Um, here you can see that deer piece in context, a blowing frozen paper that we saw earlier. Uh, and then again, another iteration of those planes unraveling out of that lampshade. Yeah. And it's nice to have a big open space like that for your work. Yeah? I, I feel so fortunate to have gotten to do large scale things. So let's let's keep on looking at the at the next piece that we've got here. Um, uh, the more airplanes. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a studio shot of just kind of how I play with things. Uh, there's a a metal carved uh, airplane coming out of a shovel, and there's wood floors climbing up the wall, and other shovels thinking about excavation. And now, is that spaces. something else that you taught yourself to do? Uh -huh. Yeah, YouTube. YouTube is, YouTube is great. <laughs> it sounds like who needs an MFA as long as YouTube's around, right? <laughs> yes, the MFA is great for learning to, to conceptualize, but um, yeah, there's there's wonderful sources yeah. for learning things. Yeah. Okay, let's keep on uh, keep on looking at the, the work here. So this is something a little bit different. The the, the boat. What, what, remind me of the title of this. Um, this piece is called Cargo um, or Climbing. Sometimes I change titles. Okay, okay. <laughs> I think it most recently was titled Cargo. Uh, I have been interested in, like the airplane might carry people or like animals might represent um, subconscious archetypes, uh, the boat for me has offered a possibility for individuals to put themselves in it and imagine a life experience. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm also very interested in boats that they are are suspended in the kind of material of air and water, okay. which is so different from our right. ground. I mean, right. I guess it's not that different, but, um, and so traversing above and below, there's a welded chain that connects this to the wall, so mm -hmm. it's self-supporting, um, and then the ladder kind of goes back and forth between them. I love it. And this connects to uh, quite a few other pieces. I think the next image uh, may also have boats on it. These are a series of handmade wooden boats that are going down a long river of water glasses and wine right. glasses filled with partial water. Right. There's a detail there we go. here. And that, so the, the boats are handmade, the, the water glasses are just from Walmart. Collected at every Goodwill in, <laughs> in the area. <laughs> On the half price day, mind you. Yeah, right, sure. Uh, because there are, there are a lot of glasses in there. Here. Are, yeah. So is this, how long was this, this work up? I think this work was up for four months, three or four months. Okay, so did you have to periodically refill the glasses? They did, in fact, and one thing you learn when you do odd installations is weird things happen. So oh. they, of course, the water evaporates, sure. and that was part of it. It was about drought, it was about preservation right. of, of resources, it was about um, preservation of self. But they would dry up and leave this filmy stuff. Oh. Sometimes they so you had to clean the glasses? Moldy. So there was this phenomenal staff at the museum. Oh, wow. And they were like the shepherds of the water river. Yeah. And they cleaned them with vinegar and then refilled them. Oh, man. I think once or twice in the run. Wow. So wow. it was really, really, really well cared for. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's a lucky. <laughs> uh, let's see what we got here. Oh, this is a, a, taking several different of your, of your, your themes. It's a gorgeous blue. Wow. Mm. I mean, it just really knocks your eyes out. Uh, what are we looking at here? Thank you. In recent years, I um, have been really enthralled with the oaks, uh, the California oaks around um, Santa Barbara and San Ynez. And so I have begun to paint those. I also have started to look at the, my practice as having so much white space behind them. Mm -hmm. It's kind of open white space. And I was trying to imbue them with a deeper volume. Uh, and night is obviously the opposite of that. Uh, there's a ghost-like image of a boat here. There's also a collision. You can see the oak returning into a domestic space. Um, this was during our um, season of drought. Mm -hmm. uh, so there were kind of hopes and wishes for right, water. Right. Which this work now um, is very different in context after we um, had the tragic um, debris flow. Mm -hmm. um, that's not made about that, but it, um, it was made before it, but it has a different lens now. So I'm, I'm interested in the 
natural components that we see in nature and how they uh, give light to our experience. This piece I'm really honored was recently um, acquired by the Santa Barbara Museum of Art. Uh -huh. um, and it, you can see it starts to blend together, mm -hmm. the, the boat carrying these falling sycamore leaves and an oak tree in deep rocks. Here the boat seems to be connected to a tree and yeah. the sails seem to be some kind of sheets. I say seem to be because often when I make things, I'm not really sure. Yeah. <laughs> well, and I'm not speaking just because I'm kind of uh, floating in this world of wonder <laughs> as, Thank you. as, I, watch, really as I watch what you've got. This work um, was up at uh, a recent exhibition at Sullivan Goss. Uh, it's entitled Lumens and um, the kind of fantastical nature of illuminating a boat from underneath and above. In this exhibition, there were a series of other things illuminated by that night sky. This is a gorgeous new Mertila crest cactus that mm -hmm. I got for my garden and oh, wow. had to paint it first. Right, right. <laughs> uh, and then a final image of the exhibition installation, as yeah. you can see a larger scale painting. Fantastic. Well, as we come back, we just have about two minutes left. And, and I, I told you before we started taping that I wanted to have you give some advice to aspiring artists. You, you do that all the time for a living. Um, but um, in, in you know, a minute and a half, what would you say to people who want to become artists? The first thing I'd say is don't be afraid to make because uh -huh. that's the only way to go through the bad ones. Okay. Um, there's an artist that I heard in um, describing his experience painting in France. Uh, and he said, I can still see my first 200 plein air paintings they were flying like frisbees across the French landscape. <laughs> so, I love that, that it just takes 200, you know, that or more. Right. Um, so making and being ready and free to do that. Right. And the second one um, is something that my colleague, Dr. Lisa DeBoer says at Westmont, uh, where she asks people, what's your, what's your core life question? And that's a big statement. Sure. But, but what questions keep coming up for you in your life that you keep resonating and ruminating on uh, and drawing from those as inspiration? And you've that's clearly done that with your work. Yeah. It's something that has worked for me, and so I... So what, what matters to you is what you ultimately make art about. Yeah. yeah. And what I want to know from other people, what, right. they, what matters to them. Right. Like what narratives are in each of us. Right. Well, that is such an eloquent way <laughs> to finish our interview. Mm -hmm. Thank you so very much for, for talking with me. I really My appreciate pleasure. it. Thank you so much. It's been a joy. The Creative Community is produced in Santa Barbara with a generous grant from the Diana and Simon Robb Foundation with J.P. Montalvo today doing everything. Thank you, J.P. I'm your host, David Starkey. We'll see you next time. Thank you.